Okay, everybody, let's get started. All the world is watching the Met Gala. There is nothing more spectacular in the world in terms of fashion and jewelry and self-presentation than the first Monday in May in the Costume Institute Gala. Is that the Toussaint? Mm. I'd say you look like a million bucks, but it's more like a hundred million. Thank you. It's 150 million, actually. <laughs> Everybody who's anybody is at that gala. Romances start and end there. Um, connections are made. This is the Met Gala, after all. Gala. Met Gala. It was pretty exciting to be in the Met and recreate this. I mean, I've been to the Met Ball twice myself, so um, I didn't have to do a lot of acting to imagine what that would be like to be in the Met Ball. I mean, you never know who you're gonna see. It's like stars from all over the planet, meaning actors, uh, people in the fashion industry. The night that we shot, you know, the big Met Ball with all the celebrities, it, we just I was just sitting in the corner watching it all, just, Movie making is pretty amazing sometimes, and, and that was a piece of movie making I'd never experienced before. In three and a half weeks, the Met will be hosting its annual ball, considered to be one of the most exclusive. The most exclusive. The most exclusive party invitation in America. <laughs> Met Ball really has become its own moment in the calendar. The first Monday in May is the start of our exhibition at the Costume Institute. So each spring we do a major exhibition and the gala really celebrates it. It's really become the epicenter of the fashion world. You know, it's New York's version of the Oscars. Met Ball's the most famous party in the world. It was a jewelry heist that we wanted to do and rather than stealing it from a jewelry case or a vault. We thought we'd talk our way out of the vault and steal it from someplace interesting. In the same way that the Bellagio is such a central part of Ocean's Eleven, the Met is, it is New York. So Gary went straight to Vogue, was his first meeting with Anna Wintour. Vogue was very open to doing this. I mean, I think they saw synergy. I think that Anna realized in her first conversation with me that I was not gonna make fun of this, but celebrate it, and that we were gonna devote the resources necessary to put on a Met Ball that was worthy of the ones that they stage. We started out thinking we had to build the set, and through conversations with Vogue, Anna Wintour introduced us to the president of the Met, and it just made sense for everyone. They wanted the Met to be the Met, we wanted the Met to be the Met, and it just wouldn't have been the same on stage. We were honored to be asked to have an opportunity to be part of the movie. And the entire crew, the cast, the director, everyone was so respectful of this institution, we thought it would be a good partnership. I've actually grown close to a lot of the people at the Met. The first thing is to promise them, you know, first we will do no harm, that we respect the institution above all else. We understand that we're being given access to something that's pretty extraordinary and pretty rare. This is something very, very special to me, and I consider, you know, their collection to be a pretty hallowed thing. And Russia, and camera, and Director Gary Ross, just he knew the museum so well, and Gary's knowledge of the museum, I think, was really helpful in everybody's awareness about the precious works of art. Because, look, I'm sitting next to John Singer Sargent's Madame X, and they're like, you know, grips walking around with C-stands. I mean, literally one false move, and it's, you've wrecked more than the budget of the movie. You know, Gary really wanted it to be the Met Gala, not a movie version of it. We worked closely with Vogue to make sure that it was as accurate as it could be. The commitment to authenticity, I think, began with Gary Ross, the director. Um, he really wanted to bring the museum as much to the fore as possible. So a lot of the shots even started on art and then would kind of pan into the event itself and the characters. Anna Wintour suggested Hamish Bowles to help in curating the costume exhibition. Hamish was fantastic. He came in, he did the costume collection that would be there for the Met Gala. When Gary first showed me his visuals and his concept for this room, his idea it was this kind of end of empire, almost like a crumbling Venetian palazzo with the furniture submerged. So 
we've framed the exhibition around the idea of royal dress and its enduring influence on fashion designers. And we've done it absolutely as we would curate a, a, a legitimate museum show. I arrived at this idea that if I was going to use the Temple of Dender, that I had to reconcile this large Egyptian monument with my theme, which was European royalty. So we created Versailles around the Temple of Dender, and it sort of existed harmoniously. We practically created the Versailles garden. Exactly. You know, all the greenery, all the topiaries, the gazebo covered in ivy, the stairs. Gary and Raul worked together to have this idea of coming from outside in the gardens to walking through this gate and having footmen dressed in these resplendent pastel costumes. And it was a very colorful, beautiful, grand uh, entrance into the exhibition. We've cr created two rooms in this kind of imagined um, exhibition. The first is kind of like the Queens and the Hive. It explores Tudor and Elizabethan dress, and we have an amazing dress that Sarah Burton designed for Alexander McQueen, and two extraordinary haute couture dresses by Maria Grazia and Pier Paolo, who uh, were then designing together at Valentino. And then the second room, which we're in now, and the um, set designers have created this incredible late 18th century French room. We've done the idea of the kind of waning days of the French monarchy in the late 18th century. I'm almost sorry that the show couldn't have stayed up so that people could have come to see that show because it was so beautiful, it really should be a show at the Met. One of the best parts of the movie is that we all exit the Met Gala in gowns. All of us ladies got to wear some pretty amazing dresses for the Met Ball that were made for our characters. For each one of them, we wanted there, there to be something that, about their character and their personality that the dress tied into. And so we each have a designer who is making a custom gown for this very movie. Naeem Khan made Mindy Kaling's gown. It is a spectacularly embroidered gold dress with a cape. The color, the gold, I think was a little bit of a nod to her being the jeweler. Alberta Ferretti did my dress, and when it showed up, and it was this cape and the embroidery and the craftsmanship that was put into it, I go, I'm not gonna be able to take that home at the end of the movie. Usually I try to steal everything and it's hanging in my closet. It's like, I'm not gonna get away with stealing that one. That's gonna go into some sort of Warner Brothers archival you know, museum because it's, it's a work of art. And halfway through, late at night at the Met, I looked down at the bottom of the dress and I looked back at the train and I went, oh my God, did anyone else realize the nautical theme? There were starfish and there were shells and there were, it was like embroidered waves, all embroidered in gold and silver on top of the sea of black. And I went, oh, Debbie Ocean. Valentino made Daphne's dress. She is basically the queen of the ball. I have a long history with the House of Valentino, so I knew whatever they would deliver would be incredible. I don't know, just for me personally, I love um, in the old movies when you would see like Grace Kelly's wardrobe designed by and it was some famous designer, Audrey Hepburn's wardrobe designed by Hubert de Givenchy. And so to know that I was getting a moment like that for myself, it actually felt really lovely. We wanted her to have this incredible royal presence, and Valentino did this train for her that's about a 15-foot train, and when she goes up the grand staircase at the Met, that is such a spectacular image of the train going behind her. Every time I put that cape on, oh my gosh, I could just imagine all of the seamstresses back in Italy sewing it, and I felt very grateful. Dolce & Gabbana made Helena Bonham Carter's dress, and it was just so much fun. You have to have at least five fittings for a couture frock, but my body was in New York, obviously, filming, and they were... So I went to Milan for a day on Christmas break, and that was amazing, and I went to their studio, and I saw this frock in the corner, which was this sort of 50s white, sleeveless, beautiful frock, but with roses all over. And I said, well, that's Rose. Dolce & Gabbana did this headpiece for her that had all of these little birds on the top of her head. It was sort of playing with the idea of her aesthetic as Rose Wheel, the fashion designer. Kate didn't wear a gown. 
Tate wore a jumpsuit. Givenchy did the dress. It's an archival piece, which we thought really worked well for Lou's character, that she would wear something maybe that came out of the archives. You had to find something in a way that, that the characters had access to and that had an echo of, I suppose, the character's style. I'm working with Prada and my dress is so beautiful. Prada did the most beautiful dress, but the dress also had to work for the story because she is still somewhat undercover in her Met Gala gown because she's working for Vogue. It's very Tammy. Everything about it is exactly what I would have hoped for. Jonathan Simkai made Aquafina's dress. She was the youngest of the group. I went into his showroom to try on the gown, it's so gorgeous, oh my god. It's like the prettiest thing I'll ever wear in my lifetime. But it's funny because there were actual models there like also trying things on, so they were coming out. And then comes like this Quasimodo, like Frankenstein, because I can't walk in heels, like completely tipped over, you know? For her, the transformation was really big. Going from this skateboarding kid to this very beautiful, sophisticated woman in that Jonathan Simkai gown. Working with Rihanna was really fun. Gary wanted it to be like, oh my god, you know, this incredible extreme transformation from a shapeless character in the halal cart into this just wasp-waisted goddess. We worked with Zach Posen to achieve that look. He did a fantastic job. He made the dress for her. You know, complete Cinderella transformation. No one can do it better than Rihanna. I'm super happy with how our gala turned out. It was really uh, ambitious. Fortunately, we got to shoot in the Met. If we hadn't shot in the Met, I think it would have been literally impossible. But then you have design challenges where you have to live up to not only what the Met Ball actually is, but what people's imagination of it is. And so I think it lives up to, you know, any Met Ball, and I, I'm super proud of it. If you could imagine the love child between Ocean's Eleven and the Devil Wears Prada, I think that's what Ocean's Eight is. $16.5 million in each of your bank accounts five weeks from now. There's a kind of constant pinch me moment of not only am I in New York working, but I'm in New York working on this movie, this reimagining of a movie that I have loved and is so much fun and with this group of girls. And it's a pretty extraordinary thing. It really is. Sandra Bullock paid me a lot of money to say that, so. It's about costumes, it's about pushing the boundaries, it's about storytelling, it's about couture, it's about expressing yourself with fabric and construction. We've lost that element that you used to have in the 30s and the 40s and 50s, and we get to have it again. Maybe we could give her this. Must be where it's quite hard. We can be criminals too. Women can be, so it was about time. I wanted it to be joyous. Yes! I wanted it to be a celebration of these women coming together. I wanted it to be offbeat or eclectic in the way that the previous franchise was, but to have its own identity. a style and a feeling to the Oceans movies and a jazzy and a breeziness and a coolness and that that's really what it feels like when you say an Oceans movie you immediately know what that connotes. Why do this? Why not do it? They were really sophisticated heist movies that had a sense of style and fun and fashion about them. Why do you need to do this? Because it's what I'm good at. What does Oceans mean? What does the idea of that mean? It can mean a different thing in each particular era. So obviously when the Rat Pack was there, there's a devil make care attitude to them. There was a devil make care attitude to Brad and George and all of that. And it's wonderful now that there's a bit of a devil make care attitude to this group of women. Only way to con a con, right? It was really exciting to feel like we were having a relationship and a dialogue with those movies, but it's kind of its own new thing. Okay, everybody, let's get started. We're taking kind of the outlaw trope, which is the center of American cinema in a lot of ways, and we're taking that real estate and we're giving it to this group of amazing women. 
And it's not so much what they're stealing, it's, I think it's the thrill of the steal and seeing if they can steal it. These are eight women who are excellent at their jobs. They just happen to be criminals. So often in, in film, women have to carry the baggage and the burden of justifying their action and why they're pursuing something because we expect women to be motivated by deep, dark secrets or we want them to sort of carry that weight. But we also wanted to explore the feeling of what is it like to get to enjoy having fun, pulling off a massive heist with eight badass women? What does that feel like? Yeah. I think like, why did they do it? because it's worth $150 million. Because they're I, I, criminals and they want to steal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and, that's, and that is at once simple and profound. Yes. There's eight wonderfully complex, smart, funny, out of control sometimes women who are going to take you on their own journeys that will um, give you some more twists. Like all of the, the Oceans film, what and this one has in common with the other ones, is that there's always a twist inside the twist inside the twist. But I think, you know, Gary and all of the people making the film have used it in a very witty way. So it sort of subverts expectations, I think. I think the fun thing about this was you have a heist. Breathe. You know, I'm pretty sure you think we're going to be successful at the heist. So in the end, that's going to happen. But what the movie is really about is the little nuances and the little twists that happen along the way. Can't we just go to this? Do we have to steal stuff? Yes. yes. It was very exciting finding these eight strong, distinct, individual women and to put this gang together. Gary Ross really assembled a, a group of girls that really feel to me like a group of girls that would hang out. And yet, we're all very different. That's what's interesting is, is the, chem the alchemy of getting all these very different women from different backgrounds and disciplines, all in one film and seeing what's going to happen. Everybody comes with their own amazing assets, visually and in talent and skill. And the fact that we're so diverse, there's eight of us, not one of us is like the other one, and but that wasn't a problem, that was an asset. You know, when you have eight movie stars in a movie like this, you would expect that there would be some kind of drama, but I have to be honest, the drama never came. Their chemistry is amazing, both on set and off. I think they all had such a great time together, and I think it comes across in the movie. And that's something, you know, you could never, you could never plan the alchemy of that, and it has, it has been a really great. There's not a bad apple in the bunch. I mean, there's one, but I'm not gonna say who it is. There's a tension between the characters, but there was none of that tension on set. Everyone was really excited to be there, and, you know, they have a healthy disrespect and respect for each other. Everyone's available to talk about the characters. Everyone's available if you have a question about how to raise your kid. Some of us were parents, struggling at where do I buy the uniform, the Halloween costume. It was a big nest, and you felt very cared for. I've gotten fashion tips from Rihanna. I've gotten, you know, the best facialist from Sandy. My goal when I said yes to doing this movie was the only thing I want is by the end of this movie, I want to know where Rihanna goes dancing. Otherwise, there's no point in me doing this movie. Citizen Four, Citizen Four. It's on HBO. When you get to the set, you see these eight amazing women, and there's this incredible alchemy that's taking place between these eight creative people. Constance will do what Constance does. Let's throw deep to her out of the A, out of, sorry, out of the B. Let's throw deep to her, to Constance, OK? Thank you. Gary Ross is such a brave guy. <laughs> I really can't think of anyone else who could have done this. And you know, sometimes writers, they don't like you to improv. But he's a writer. He loves to improv. He's a director, and he cares so much about his shots. But he also is welcome to, to your input. He really just wants that, to make everybody feel welcome, to make everybody feel valued, to make everybody feel like they're giving the performance that they want to give, that everybody looks great. You know, some movies you make, they're like handmade. You want to get in and control every little detail. In this movie, you know, I'm kind of the dude in the room. So that's when I sort of sit back and watch this incredible energy, this electricity, this alchemy happen. You're not bored out here, are you, Tam Tam? No, I'm, no? Not, I'm not bored no? out here at all. Good. No. Good, good. good. Why, why would you ask that? Because I need a fence. You know, I'm glad I did this at this point in my career when I know a little more about when to shut up on the set and sort of let things happen instead of always trying to make them happen. I have never done this many costumes before in my life ever. When you think Sandra Bullock had 60 changes 
And I think Kate was up to 38 by the time we wrapped. It was, sort of became a fashion parade almost. It was just, you know, a riot of color and silhouette and texture. Every day, another one. You know, if you're a woman, and what you're wearing is going to be very important. Part of defining us also just as dolls, as it were, and different characters is obviously what we look like and what we're wearing. And you could see us as dolls. I wonder if they'll ever do us as merchandise. When we first started thinking about these characters, it was very important to Gary that they each have their own identity, that they each have a very sort of individual personality. You know, we used to joke that they all needed to stay in their own lanes. Each girl also brought a lot to the table about how they saw their characters, so it became not just me and Gary, but also the women. This is a collaborative conversation occurring with the actors, so every single actor contributed enormously to their wardrobe and their clothing as they're creating their character. One of the cool things about this movie is we shot in the real Cartier, the real Vogue offices, the real Met, the TWA terminal. This movie gives you an access to a storied part of New York that most people will never gain entrance to. You know, New York's a a character in the film, and it centers around a heist at the Met, so you couldn't possibly shoot it anywhere else. I got to go into the world of Vogue and meeting Anna and having Anna's help and meeting designers, going to the shows on Fashion Week. I mean, you begin to assimilate a world. The fashion communities really come out in full force for this film. A lot of designers came, a lot of socialites, actors, they came out in support of this, which is very nice because I don't think they knew what they were getting into. I think some of them thought that it was going to be like two takes and, you know, smile for the cameras and then leave. And cut. We're going again. Some of them were very surprised at how many times we had to do it. One person turned to us and said they thought it was rude <laughs> how many times we had to do it. And we looked at her and we were like, no, 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 we, we love this. We, this is what we do. This is a heist movie. Heist movies are always fun. You know, how will they get the whatever they're stealing and what antics will happen along the way. But to me, more importantly, this is about women who are incredibly talented at what they do. And they don't really get to do it because it's usually done by the men. Each of these characters, for whatever reason, has been somewhat held back, whether it's because of their relationships with their families and the expectations placed on them to marry, or because they've already been married and they they are living a certain kind of life, or because they're on either side of the law, or because they have criminal past, and they've never really gotten to have something of their own. And it's only by doing it together that they're able to accomplish that goal. To our dear friend, Carl. Claude. Claude. Trecker, may he rest in peace and prison. Cheers. Cheers. You get the feeling that they're at once incredibly ambitious and opportunistic because they're thieves, and at the same time, they're very selfless in how they take care of each other. To me, it's about their family. They're a family of thieves, but they're a family. The success of a movie like this is really in the creation of the ensemble. You're going to make a lot of creative decisions along the way, but if you don't pick the right eight women, to come together and create this chemistry, it's never gonna fly. And so the assemblage of that cast and the diversity of it, the interrelationship between the characters, that's really the biggest job I had. When we first started thinking about these characters, they were very clearly written on the page. Gary was quite descriptive about what each of these women were like. One of the things I think I'm proudest of in the movie is that there are eight distinct characters, and you could really point to and identify who each one of those women is, because there can't be anything generic about this. This celebrates their commonality, but also celebrates their differences. Jerry Weintraub, who, who produced the first set, um, got me into a room, he's like, we're gonna make it all women. I said, okay, he goes, this is gonna be great. What do you think? What do you, you kept saying, what do you wanna play? What do you wanna play? We thought about Kate and Sandy as the two women from early on, I mean, even when we were writing early drafts. They were always in our mind. Debbie is very much in the vein of George's role. Clooney, George Clooney. In that she's the mastermind. You know, she's not the one who's, who's got all the talent, but she knows talent and she knows how to put it together and she lets them do their job. How long did it take you to figure all this out? Five years, eight months, and 12 days. She's lost some time, and now she's gonna make up for some time. 
And um, she's had a lot of time to think. She's determined. She's masterful. She's organized. She's singular in her purpose. She's a leader. And I think Sandy epitomizes a lot of those things. You know, you feel that there's a mama bear quality to her. There's a precision to her. She had to have a kind of cool, sophisticated personality that came through in the clothes. It was all very long and lean and clean and minimal. And, you know, we looked a lot to George Clooney's character. Not a female version exactly, but just that you would recognize some family traits there. Turtlenecks, things like that. We played with some of that, you know, stealing a few things. Lou is a sort of rock and roll nightclub owner. She's cool. I mean, I think above all else, she's just astoundingly cool. Poised, quirky, strong, a loner, fiercely independent, her own sense of style. Gary and Stephen started talking about the cast that they wanted to assemble. And then that was the absolute why for me, you know, to finally work with Sandy, who I just think is hilarious and to work with Sarah Paulson again and finally to work with Helena Bonham Carter. We've been in a film together, but we hadn't had anything to do. Kate is one of the greatest actresses who's ever lived. And I think we're lucky that she chose to come to our party <laughs> and bring those skills to this really silly, somewhat wacky, effervescent thing that we were trying to do. And I think she had a ball doing it. Lou has had a long, incredible life. You know, maybe she'd had a really terrific kind of heyday in the 80s club scene in New York, and we wanted her to kind of still have some of those things in her closet. The thing that I wanted people to see from Kate is how, yeah, she comes with Academy Awards, and she comes with accolades, and she comes, but you can sit down and have a beer with that broad. Rose is, uh, this is a woman who's on the skids. She was like one of the greatest designers in the world, and she found herself in a moment of being kind of dated and not kind of catching up to the latest trend. And before she knew it, her profligate ways had caught up with her, and she was nearly bankrupt, which makes her kind of vulnerable to the enticements of this particular heist. At first, I thought it would be fun to be in a film that was a bit of a benchmark in, in giving so many women parts that were traditionally male. Helena has this wonderfully idiosyncratic, offbeat sense of humor that's sort of her own thing. I mean, she's really hearing uh, a different tune in her head. And you never know where Helena's gonna go in the scene. It could be written a certain way, and then there she goes. There's Helena. Don't know where she's going. Oh, she's coming back, she's coming back. Just... So it, she forced us to not get um, locked into anything. She kept us light on our feet. Helena Bonham Carter, what fun we had. We would combine like Victorian with Japanese. A lot of eccentric flourishes, feathers, bows. The thing she's wearing in her head that's basically an aviary when she goes to the netball, <laughs> that is Helena's creation, you know what I mean? She's inventive and creative in that way. I'm done. The character of Daphne is just this fabulous comedic turn, and Anne really created her out of whole cloth. She's been around show business her entire life since she was 17 years old, so she's seen all of this. Who told you? Gary and I have been trying to work together for a really long time, and he called me and he said, I have a diva for you. And he just leads into this character so well. It is so funny. It's honestly such a bold, brave performance, how far she went. There were times I'm like, really, Annie? She went, absolutely. <laughs> Just to embrace the size of this character with so much force and gusto. Holy crap. You know, you have to be kind of shameless and unafraid in comedy, and Anne just, like, completely brings that to life. Somebody asked me how it was going, and I said, I think you can see my performance from space, but... Gary and I talked about doing an, almost an old-fashioned 50s movie star as a prototype for her. She's a sort of modern-day Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor had a certain elegance and glamour to her, and I wanted Daphne to feel kind of like a low-rent version of that. And I knew that I'd be wearing diamonds, and I'd be wearing the, you know, the most amazing clothes. And so I thought, how do I sort of like undercut that sense of glamour? And I just thought nails and gum, um, you know, kind of big hair. She committed to this character of Daphne Kluger, and it was so much fun to watch because she would walk into the room and she would have these mannerisms, do these things. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. 
<laughs> and we literally were like, and I said, Annie, or is that the Barbie talking? Like, we don't know how to... And by the end, you could make fun of her character in such a genuine way, but she owned it. Thank you. She was unafraid to be, I don't want to say vapid, and make you think that there really wasn't anything between her ears, but there was. Working with Rihanna was really fun. Her character, Nine Ball, couldn't be more different from the pop star that Rihanna is. The character is Nine Ball, who's a hacker, a street hacker. A hacker is somebody who has kind of invaded the power structure, toppled the power structure, gotten inside it, and messed with it. And it was great to see her just come into a room and put on a pair of ripped jeans and an old army jacket and a pair of beat up old brown boots. She's amazing, she just became the character and she can wear it like nobody else. The cool thing about Rihanna's character is we leaned into where she's from. She played her Bayesian from Barbados, dreads the whole deal, like right from the islands and everything that that brings with it. All my ladies still in the dark. And look, you know, Rihanna is culture and counterculture all at once, all the time anyway. And so I think a lot of that is embodied in that character. I think my favorite moment was she had to do a scene typing at the computer and she had these awesome dreads. And they just kept falling in her face, but she was so good. She would just sort of push them aside and she just kept pushing them aside. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a problem. And I was like, it's getting late. So I just sat down next to her and I just grabbed the dreads and I held the dreads and that was my job. And that was my favorite moment because I kind of felt like a mom. I was like Riri's mom for just a second as I was holding the hair out of her face so she could complete her scene so we could see her beautiful mug. Came on. My character's name is Tammy. As far as I know, I don't have a last name, which I like because it makes me feel closer to Rihanna. I think it's always good if you can feel connected to Rihanna or Cher or Madonna, anyone with the one, you know, Adele, Tammy. You know, feels sort of on the same level to me. Tammy, the character played by Sarah Paulson, this woman was a soccer mom out in Connecticut whose deep secret was that she's leading a completely larcenous existence with, like, stolen blenders in her garage. How do you explain all this to your husband? eBay. Sarah Paulson is absolutely untethered. There, are, there, there were no scenes with Sarah that didn't result in a snot fest of laughter. Paulson's just a comedic genius. I mean, it's like every take is great. She can morph into just about any human being. And she and I both found it amusingly perverse that this was so kind of twisted and odd and right down to the wardrobe. My character is from the suburbs and has not really been in the game for a while, so her clothing is just like a tiny bit off, which I find really fun and delightful, unless she's wearing shoes that were really popular three years ago. But by the time they got to the suburbs, you know, she thinks she's rocking something super sassy and not so much, and that's really been fun to do. We had a lot of different looks for Sarah. It was like, the, you know, her mom look, her working at Vogue look, her sort of real self in the loft, and, you know, and then at the end, you know, a kind of newly empowered woman going back to sort of figure out what her life and her family situation, where that will all take her. A meetup, she's lived kind of under her mother's thumb for too long, so she yearns for a kind of independence, and then she literally needs to become a criminal in order to do it. Like, everybody else may be doing this to, like, make, you know, tens of millions of dollars. That's her second priority. Her first priority is, I really want to live by myself, and I don't want to live with my mom anymore. It's so much more fun to be bad than to be good, and we don't get afforded those kinds of roles all the time as women, and to also have it be so funny. Mindy does the littlest things, and until you get in the cut, you almost don't realize how funny they are, mm -hmm. and they just land. She knows how to land the joke. No, I must, I must have, I must have a son. She must have this son. You forget what Mindy does. You forget that she has this massive background in show running and writing and creating and building. And she showed up with so much humility. She's like, I'm here, whatever I need to do, whatever I can do. I think that's what I was most surprised by, at how humble she was. Constance is a sort of like an artful dodger character. She's a card player, a little bit of a con artist. She's a skateboarder. 
Nora Lum, AKA Aquafina. She plays the street hustler slash pickpocket from Queens where Nora is from. She's a rapper. She's a comedian, she's an actor, she's a writer. She's an activist. I, I keep telling her I would like to adopt you. I know you're an adult. I'm coming in with just like these just amazing actresses that I've worshipped, you know? And I think Constance is coming into a world that is incredibly intimidating for her as well. But there's a certain confidence within her that she knows she, she, she can do her job. To our dear friend, Carl. Claude. Claude. Pecker. Cheers. Cheers. This combination of talents brought together in one place, I think, was exciting for them and exciting for us. And it's above all an ensemble. And you're seeing this great band play music. It's not a solo act. And that's mm -hmm. what's so cool about it. <laughs>